My name is Ron Toland. I work for a company called Sony Incorporated. And uh, I put this talk together because I feel like we have a lot of really uh, good uh, closure technology we've built up over the past uh, six years at Sony. And, but we don't talk about it very much. And I think that's a shame. So I put this talk together to try to share with you uh, some of the ways that we've solved uh, a lot of the problems that you encounter uh, when using closure in production. So for so Sony and who? Um, so we're a small company, we do email archiving and search. As you can imagine, a lot of companies uh, now may have several decades worth of email scattered across different systems. They may have used Lotus at one point, they may have used Microsoft Exchange at another, uh, maybe they used their own Linux box for a while. Um, and, but they still wanna keep all that, keep it safe, and also be able to uh, get quick access to it at a moment's notice. Uh, so that's where our company comes in. We'll take all of that email across all those systems, uh, ingest it all, archive it in our own proprietary system, uh, and then we put it into Elasticsearch uh, to give them really fast, rapid searching of the text in those emails. So if you want to pull all the email that Bob sent out between uh, January of 1999 and December of 2001, we can give that to you. Uh, all our back-end services are built in Clojure. Uh, in fact, we were one of the first companies to use Clojure in production, uh, the same for Elasticsearch. Uh, so we've got six years of experience uh, doing this. Uh, and uh, I put millions and millions served uh, not to invoke the McDonald's metaphor too strongly, but uh, you know, a lot of people, I think the word at scale has become kind of a buzzword, so I hesitate to say it, but uh, I do want to emphasize that the system in production handles between 10 and 20 million emails every day, new emails coming into the system. Uh, so we've had to respond to a lot of uh, different stresses and loads over time uh, to come up with these solutions that we've got. So what is SAFE? So SAFE is, our solution was our, our main solution to this problem. It's the Sony Archive File Engine, what the abbreviation stands for. And it started life as our main application for this email ingestion and indexing into Elasticsearch. But over time, because of the, the stresses and strains and the problems that we've encountered in, in growing the system and, and being flexible uh, about where we've deployed and how we've deployed it and, and things like that, uh, it's actually turned out to be a really great foundation or platform for building additional closure services uh, rapidly. Uh, I'd say foundation because it's, it's a little bit more than just a library, although there's nice code in there that we use as a library, yes. Uh, but it's a little, a little less than a framework. It's not quite as opinionated as some of the other frameworks out there. Uh, so I talk of it as a foundation, some of the, a base that you could build other services on top of. And when I say different services, I mean very different. We've, uh, not, we're not only building a different metadata system for handling uh, email metadata, like the headers of the email, the to, the from, that kind of thing, uh, but also a job tracking service, uh, Elasticsearch proxy service. Uh, we're getting a diverse array of services out of this uh, foundation. So every time you design or build a new backend service, there's a set of problems you're gonna have to solve. Uh, among them, I've listed uh, eight here, yeah. Uh, you know, how do you deploy it? How do you get it into production? How do you, you know, put new code out there when it's ready? How do you configure it? So we're gonna wanna not hard code everything. We're gonna configure some values. How am I gonna do that? How do I debug it? So when I encounter pro uh, problems in production, not if, when, uh, how do you track down what's going wrong and, and be able to quickly fix it? How do you make it flexible? So if you need to run on both Linux and Windows nodes, your code's going to be different. Your service is gonna act differently you know, how can you uh, handle that uh, flexibility? How do I run, run code on startup? So when the service starts, I might need to connect to a database or connect to RabbitMQ, connect to Elasticsearch. Uh, you know, how do I make sure that code gets run, you know, consistently? How do I run periodic tasks? So we're all familiar, I think, with setting up cron jobs to run so that periodic uh, cleanup tasks or, or things get run. Uh, well, how am I gonna do that in this case when, for this service? How am I gonna give it commands? So let's say I need it to act you know, differently uh, on the fly or have some manual way to kick off a process. Am I gonna use a REST API to do that? Can I do, do it over a command line? How am I going to do that? And how do I distribute work over multiple instances? So uh, as the, the load scales, one way to respond to that is by uh, spinning up multiple copies of the same service and then distributing the work uh, among them. Well, how am I gonna do that? How am I gonna make sure that uh, you know, this one node over here isn't overloaded with too much work, and this other node is, you know, underwhelmed with too little work to do, and it's sort of sitting idle. How do I make sure that it's well balanced uh, across there? So SAFE answers all of these questions for us, uh, which is one reason it's a really good 
foundation. Uh, the parts that I'm going to talk about today only cover uh, six of, the, of these questions, though. The configuration, uh, debugging, flexibility, uh, running code on startup, and periodic tasks, and then giving it commands uh, when it's running. So the three specific parts I want to talk about are the uh, configuration system, uh, our modules system, our way of, of loading different code on startup and running it, uh, and the safe controls, which is our command line uh, way of giving uh, safe commands when it's running. So config first, uh, problem solved, I know. How do you configure it? So for us, um, our system on, systems on startup finds all the config files on the class path, um, named config.something, uh, CLJ or JSON or .edn, uh, finds all of them and merges them together into a single closure map. Uh, I've got an example on the right-hand side there of a, a path to a config file, etc safe core config.clj. Uh, and then just beneath that, I've got a sample uh, map that we would use uh, for configuration. And you can see it's just a normal closure map. You've got, uh, you know, keys pointing to, uh, with strings as values. You've got uh, keys that point to, you know, nested maps as, as values. Uh, you can put vectors in there. Uh, you can even, you notice at the bottom for the max upload, if it's a .clj file, um, it'll evaluate the, the forms that you put in there. So, instead of having to write out uh, the long sequence of, of numbers that is you know, 15 gigs in bytes, uh, you can just put the calculation in there um, and also a little comment so that you know what it is that you're, uh, that the number that you're going for there. Uh, and as you can imagine, that's much easier to update uh, you know, 15 gigs to 14 gigs just by changing one little number here in this calculation that is to uh, recalculate all the digits yourself and then put it in there. And then getting values out of that config map, uh, it's pretty simple. We have a, a function config that you call to get values out of it. Uh, I've got two example calls uh, down there at the bottom. Um, one is config core app. So that first uh, keyword there tells it to look inside the config file under the core directory. Uh, so that would point at the, the sample one I've got there. And then app means you know, pull the value out at that key. Uh, so in this case, we'd get the string safe sample. Uh, the, uh, the second one there is just an illustration of using a value uh, there that happens to be a vector and a for loop. So config core modules means go to the config file under the core directory, pull out the value in modules, happens to be a vector. Well, let's, let's iterate over that in a for loop and, and use that in some way. Uh, I do want to point out we're using, we've fallen the convention of using the uh, hash underscore for commenting in our config files. Uh, just because we found that using a normal double semicolon, we tend to, if, if you have any sort of typos or you hit return in the wrong place or Emacs reformats your file for you improperly because it's being helpful, uh, that, uh, that can lead to you know, bugs in your config file you don't want. And uh, the hash underscore is actually much less error prone. So that's just what we've adopted. So as I mentioned, it's uh, loaded in order. So uh, files that are found at first on the class path override any files that come in later. And this is really handy. We want to have one set of configuration that's the default checked into to GitHub for uh, if it were deployed to a dev or a QA environment. But locally testing on our VM, we don't want the same configuration. We're not going to connect to the same RabbitMQ with the same DB or anything. Uh, so we want a different configuration value there. Well, if you put that, that matching config file uh, inside the, the test directory uh, for like a Lightning in project, when you run line test, it'll find that config first. And so it'll override everything you've got. It's kind of nice automatic way to do it. Uh, also, it turns out uh, as we're building services on top of SAFE, that a lot of the configuration that SAFE has by default, we don't want to change. It's it's got uh, you know timeouts in there that we like. It's got you know max upload limits that we like uh, that we don't necessarily need to change from service to service to service. And uh, because of this overriding feature, we don't have to. Uh, as long as we make sure that the config file for the new service is first on the class path, it'll override all the safe values. So we can keep the ones from safe that we like, and we can override the ones that we uh, need to override for the, the service. I like the sound effects there, that was nice. So uh, also another little consequence of this is that uh, safe's config, if your fo config file gets too large, uh, again, it's gonna find all the config files on the class path and merge them in. Uh, so in Safe's case, our core config file, uh, if we were to put it all together, it would be several hundred lines long, uh, which, you know, the reader handles fine. But uh, for humans, it gets a little lengthy. You want to break that out a little bit, maybe uh, along lines, like maybe you want your AMQP config or RabbitMQ config in one file, or your Elasticsearch config in another. 
Uh, maybe you want your DB config in the file. Just sort of largely break things out. Uh, so our, our config system can handle that. Uh, I've got three sample paths there, you know, uh, all three with the same root, the Etsy safe, but under different subdirectories, you know, core, AMQP, and one under ES, uh, all named config.clj. But uh, because we've broken them out this way, we can still call into them using the same uh, config function. We just put in a different value for the uh, first keyword. So config core app will pull that app value out of the core config file. Uh, config amqp reply queue will pull the reply queue value out of the file that's under the amqp directory. Uh, and similarly for config es auth username, uh, that'll reach into a nested map that's under you know, the auth keyword in the config file in the es directory. Uh, so it's a nice way to keep your config logically organized. And uh, this particular uh, piece of safe is open sourced. We pulled it out into a library called Carica, uh, and that library has been pulled back into safe um, and is used in, in production. So you can check it out. All right, so I want to, uh, next piece is the, the module system. So this is the way that we, uh, we make the, uh, the safe server flexible. Um, so we have to actually uh, run across multiple uh, clouds, we have to run on AWS, we have to run on Rackspace, we have to run on IBM's uh, unique system. Uh, and uh, we also have to run across multiple operating systems. So there's some uh, email formats that we can only process using a Windows program. So we have to run on Windows nodes. Uh, and as you can imagine, we don't want the same uh, modules, the same code running on the Linux boxes as the Windows boxes. We need totally different uh, sets of namespaces to be pulled up and, and brought in. And that's how our, uh, our modules help us do that. Uh, our also our modules give us a standard way to uh, write code that needs to run on startup and also run uh, time tasks. So our uh, system hangs off of uh, a config auto require. So um, I'll, as we saw on the sample config file here, you see under the modules key is the list of namespaces. So that's how uh, that's basically how we we decide which modules get uh, loaded up and run. Uh, for each safe service. Uh, we have several written out into a config file and then environment variables which will sw switch out which type of safe server is starting. Similarly, when we're building on top of safe, uh, the, ser the new service that we define, we define sort of uh, not only the, the code that we've written but also in the config saying, all right, load these three namespaces from safe, these modules from safe, but then load the these three new modules to give you that new behavior. So it's completely configuration control and uh, each one of those namespaces on startup will get uh, automatically required uh, into the, uh, the running JVM. And then uh, we have, for startup and shutdown tasks, we have uh, two macros, do init and do fini. Uh, so the do init gives you a single place in your module to say, all right, if this module is loaded, when the safe server starts, you're going to run this code. And uh, on startup, it, what uh, safe will do is go through all of the do inits that have been defined in the modules that have been loaded, according to config, uh, and run that code. So whether that's connecting to a database or connecting to uh, RabbitMQ, uh, that sort of startup code uh, will happen there. And similarly for the do finis, uh, that's code that gets run on uh, shutdown. So if there's any cleanup tasks that your module will need to do or things you need to take care of, uh, that's where you would uh, put those inside the module. Uh, we have ticks and talks, so we have def tick and def talk. Uh, two macros for defining periodic tasks. So in each of our, uh, on each of our safe servers, there's a cron job that runs at the 41st. I wish it were 42, but it's 41. It's the 41st minute uh, of every hour. Uh, and what, what that does is use one of the safe controls that I'm going to go into more detail later, but it runs a command line command to safe, say, hey, run all the uh, ticks and talks that you have defined. And safe will then uh, look through all the modules that have been uh, loaded and then run any of their ticks and talks that are there. <coughs> we have functions, I'll show you in a second, that help us narrow down a bit, uh, particularly give us a little more control over when exactly a, a, a thing is running. Well, we can be assured if we've defined it in def tick or def talk, it'll have a chance to run at that uh, scheduled time. Uh, modules are also where we define, we use a macro called do status. So there's a standard uh, safe con command, a safe control called safe control status. Uh, that you run just to ask a, a node you know, how you're doing, uh, and uh, it'll respond with, you know, I'm, uh, 
with a certain basic set of information, uh, like you know, if it's running, what type of, of safe node it is, how long it's been up. Uh, and then also, any additional information you want to make sure the user has, you can define in a module as part of a new status. Uh, anything you want to put in there. Um, you know, I'm connected to Postgres, and uh, this is you know, the IP address of the server I'm connected to. Or I'm connected to RabbitMQ, and I'm listening to uh, these three exchanges. Uh, you can define all of those inside the do status. It gives you a nice single place to uh, hang that. Uh, modules are also where we use a macro called def admin, um, and which is where we define additional uh, safe controls, additional command uh, line commands that we can give to the, to the running safe. Uh, spoilers, because I'm, I'm going to talk more about those later. But um, the point is that uh, you know, all of these things uh, that, we're, uh, that we're getting, it's a single place to hang them all. And because it's configuration controlled, through config, I get really, really uh, you know, fine-grained control over the behavior of the safe server or the additional services that we build on top. So I have a couple examples here. Did everybody read that OK? I know that for some of the distance, that may be difficult. No one's objecting, so it must be fine. OK. Uh, so this is a sample of a do-init, uh, a use of the, the do-init macro. Uh, so in this case, this would be like for an HTTP module. And uh, what we're uh, seeing here is uh, when you, the safe server starts up, uh, always uh, start up a, a, a Jetty instance using the uh, routes that are defined under the REST app symbol uh, on a port that, if you'll notice, is controlled by config. We're pulling out a value config core REST services port and using that in here. Uh, so giving us, again, you know, config to control what this module is doing. Uh, an additional control, uh, you know, just below that, we're doing checking additional config value. If we're configured to run the external REST services, uh, so an external API, then run a second uh, JETI instance with a second set of defined uh, routes um, on a different port uh, and start that up. So uh, again, a single place you know, inside the module to run, OK, everything we need to do on startup, this is where it is. This is a uh, sample of uh, a def talk uh, definition. So it's, it's lengthy, but all the work actually happens just at the uh, very bottom there, that last uh, line stage sample files. That's the function that may eventually get called. Um, but uh, the win check at the top is saying, OK, I know I'm going to um, be called. I'm going to be run on the 31st minute of every hour. But I don't want to run every hour. I only want to run uh, you know, once a day on a certain day. So we have a win check there to check, you know, is the current hour one? So is it 1.41 in the morning? And is the current day of the month uh, equal to the configured day of the month, the config core SMTP talk day of the month uh, for this particular talk to run? So we can control in config uh, not only that this talk is running at all by loading the module, but also when this talk gets run by controlling this config value. And this is a sample of a, a do status. Uh, so here this is for like a, a RabbitMQ module. Um, here we're uh, getting a sequence of queues, uh, and then we're telling the user uh, this safe node is listening uh, on these queues, and then we're looping over the queues. And you can see we're using the, the Doric library uh, to build out a nice, uh, nicely formatted table of uh, values of the, the name of the queue and its priority, uh, and then we're sending that off to the user. So one thing I want to point out for all of these, all three of these, the dev talk, the do in it, uh, the do status, is that they in no way have uh, any idea or need to know about other modules that have been loaded into the system. You know, this, this module needs to tell the user when it asks for status about the RabbitMQ queues it's listening on, and that's it. And it doesn't have to know or need to know about uh, anything else that's going on in, in the server system. It's completely independent in that way. And most of the, these pieces, the, the dev talks, the do uh, things like that, have been open sourced into a library called Carousel. The, uh, one piece that's missing is uh, the piece that I'm, I'm going to talk about next, the, uh, the safe controls, which are those def admins I mentioned. So the safe controls uh, give us a command line interface to send commands to uh, safe. And they help us uh, solve problems like you know, debugging and giving it commands on the fly, which it's important for us as developers to be able to do this you know, when we're testing a system uh, you know, on dev or QA to make sure it's running. But it, it, for us, it becomes really important for customer service and ops people to be able to do this. Uh, as you can imagine, you know, they're on the front lines of the customers with a uh, client 
signs up for our service and they go through the email ingestion period and then they go to do a search for email in 1999 and it's not there, they're going to be upset. Uh, and they're not going to call me, they're going to call customer service uh, and they're going to talk to the ops people and say, hey, what's going on? And I don't want them to call me. I want them to be able to you know, solve the problem themselves, not only because I don't, I don't want to be bothered, but also uh, because it'll make them more responsive to the customer, right? I mean, if, if they can answer the question you know, in five minutes themselves, uh, and fix it if there actually is a problem, then that customer's happier, you know, we get uh, more business and, and I get a better bonus. Just kidding about the bonus. Uh, anyway, so, uh, so it's really critical that, that, they, uh, that we, we add these. And we often add these when we find that Ops has been doing something over and over and over again and it's starting to frustrate them. Uh, we'll add a safe control and solve that problem for them and give them a nice uh, single way to do it. So this is just a, uh, a few sample uh, calls of how you would invoke uh, safe control. Uh, so the first one is the safe control status I was talking about. Uh, the second one is the safe control util REPL. Uh, and this is how we get a live REPL on a running safe node. So you know, sometimes when you're debugging, uh, you know, the existing safe controls we have aren't enough uh, and uh, we just need to get in there and see what's going on. So we you know, get onto the node, issue a safe control util REPL, and we're in a live REPL system. We can require any of the namespaces we have, we can, uh, you know, uh, run code and really find out what's happening and, and uh, what's going on in the system. Sorry, I'm just gonna check on time here. I think I'm doing okay. All right, and the last one there um, is an example of safe control that we're gonna, I'm gonna show you the definition for a little later on. Uh, safe control import EMLs, dash dash account 42, dash dash URL, walrusbucket.eml, uh, because he's always looking for it. Uh, so you can see it's just a, it's a really, it's this very simple, uh, straightforward interface, um, you know, e easy to use. Uh, if you issue uh, safe control help any of these commands, uh, you get a, a doc string that tells you how to use the command and, and what sort of arguments it takes, uh, which is really nice. Yeah. And so, for us, the, the benefit here is, is that it's important that we uh, be able to define these commands, to be able to define new ones, but also that we be able to define new ones well. And so our uh, def admin macro gives us that. It gives us a, a nice uh, single place and a, a good way to, to define these new commands so that we know everything will be in place and ready for ops to use it when they need to. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the doc streams and work with Valinor. I think it's easier to see an example. So, Here's a, the full definition, uh, the def admin uh, import EMLs. Um, I, here I just want to note the, uh, the different pieces. I'm gonna, we're gonna zoom in uh, on those a bit, a bit more, but you can see the, you know, the general structure, the def admin, some you know, uh, name symbol, uh, a doc string, a set of args, and then an invoke with valid args uh, function call uh, along with uh, a set of uh, uh, flag sets and validators. So just to zoom in a bit, on the first piece, so def admin import email. So the, the import slash emails uh, is what uh, allows the uh, safe control to be able to decide that it's going to run this code. So if you, looking back at that example, safe control import email. So we have a, uh, a shell script uh, safe control that uh, when you invoke it, it will take all of its arguments, the import emails, the dash dash account, et cetera, uh, turn it into a vector and send it to a socket. And then SAFE has a socket server listening on that socket. Um, and it is using basically a big def multi. Um, and it uses the, the first two arguments there to switch, uh, to dispatch on uh, which one is getting invoked. So by using import slash emails, what we're saying is, um, you know, this emails command is going to live under uh, the import uh, the import, the, all, all the other import commands. So if you do save control help import, you'll see a list of, of commands that have been defined under it, including this new one, this, this emails. Uh, and then the particular invocation here is, will be in emails. So you'll need to write, to do save control import emails to get this one. And then following that, we have the, the doc string. And this doc string is what defines the help text that a user sees um, if you say save control help import emails. And we're, this is actually, it may seem lengthy, but this is actually really short. Uh, I, I had to cut this into about a third uh, just to fit it on the slide because we're, we're very, very picky about what goes into these doc strings. Um, we really want them to be detailed and up to date and very, very complete. Um, again, not just for ourselves so that, you know, we have help text available when we go in to debug the system, but for the ops people. Like, we don't, we don't want them to have to, you know, scramble for a manual or look things up all the time 
uh, when using these commands. We want them to be able to get you know, on-the-spot help. Um, we also want them to be able to use the commands correctly every time. And if they forget you know, what, uh, you know, uh, how the dates should be formatted if they're inputting you know, uh, from and to dates to a command, uh, we want them not to have to use trial and error, especially in a production system, uh, we want them to be able to know exactly how to format it. So if we do have uh, dates in there, we'll list out sample formats. Um, and often at the bottom of these, we'll list out full invocations to show exactly you know, how you should put in uh, arguments and everything uh, to the safe control so you can use it properly. And then at the bottom there, we've got uh, just a, a variable number of args that this uh, uh, function is taking. So the next piece is the invoke with valid args. And uh, again, you see that it's, uh, it's taking in the args that we got. Uh, there's a function there, do initiate emails import, and then there's a, a map uh, which has flag sets and validators. And what uh, this function does, this handles basically all the validation for all of our def admins. Um, so it's saying, take these arguments and give it to this function, do initiate emails import, but only do it if the arguments that you've got match these uh, parameters, define it or flag sets, and only do it if the arguments that you've got also pass validation defined in the validators here. So uh, the flag sets we have designed here, uh, defined here, you can see we're using sets uh, to define what, uh, what, uh, what arguments are valid. So the first listing there, the set of sets, uh, account and URL, uh, what that's saying is that w you must pass in account and URL when invoking this command. If you just send account or if you just send a URL arg, um, it's going to kick out an error message to the user saying, you know, you're missing arguments and it's not going to invoke the do initiate emails import. That's not going to get called at all. Um, the next piece there is defining some optional arguments. Um, we have zip password and foreground. And the way that those are defined uh, using the options there in, in, in sets of one uh, is saying that you, they could pass in a zip password, they could pass in a foreground argument, uh, they don't have to, um, but if they do, they can pass either one, they can pass both, it doesn't matter. We also have ways of uh, defining op options so that uh, if one optional uh, argument is passed, another one also has to be passed. So you can imagine if you were to take a username and password at the command line, one of them is not useful. You need both. So, but they might both be optional arguments. So we have ways to define that as well. So if the right uh, kind of arguments are there, if the account is there and the URL is there, maybe zip password foreground are there, okay, then we gotta pass, everything's gotta pass validation. Uh, so here we've only defined one validator for the account. Uh, so we're taking that in and uh, pulling the account out, and we're checking to see, first of all, did they send us just one? If you send us more than one account, uh, I don't know how to process that. I'm, I'm not going to do anything. So it'll fail validation, and again, it'll kick out an error message saying invalid accounts, um, and the do initiate emails import will not run. Okay, we'll say they passed one account, but they have passed uh, an account that we don't know about, that the safe server uh, has no idea about. Well, we check that. So we ask, is it a valid account? Is it, is it a number if we're using MySQL IDs for this? Uh, you know, is it a is it actually in our database? Do we know about it? Again, if not, throw an error message, don't invoke the function. Uh, so that we know that uh, when do initiate emails import gets called, it's got all the arguments that it needs and they're all valid because we've, we've defined all that here. It gives us a nice single place to do that. Now in actual safe, we have uh, a long list of default validators because you often need to check accounts, or URLs, things like that over and over and over again. So, uh, we actually have a default set that uh, gets invoked uh, almost every time, and you can define additional validators as you want. Open source soon. So th this is, uh, like I said, the, the piece that's missing from Carousel there. Um, we do plan to have it open source soon. I personally really want to have it out because I think it's uh, really, really useful, and I like to see it uh, used more often. All right, so that's all I have. I think I might actually, a little bit early, maybe right on time. Uh, I do want to mention that we're, we're hiring, like a lot of uh, closure companies, it seems, uh, especially after the little informal survey yesterday, where one out of three of us apparently is hiring people. We're also hiring people. Uh, so if you like what you uh, saw here, if you're like, man, you know, it'd be really nice to have all those problems solved for me when I go to build a back-end closure service. I could focus on other things, you know, uh, other problems to, to solve. Uh, please come talk to me uh, afterwards. Uh, or grab me at the Puppet Labs uh, party, which I plan on going to, 
and uh, let's talk. Thanks. So I think we have time for questions. If anybody has anything they're additionally curious about, or if I've answered all your questions, that's also fine. I see a, I see a hand pointing, but I don't see a hand up. Oh, man. I'm sorry, I'm short. I can't see you. <laughs> uh, so you, uh, it seems like you expose production to some potentially dangerous uh, services there. How do you protect against customer service doing the right thing? You, you're, are you talking about like uh, with, the, with the, the safe controls, yeah. like customer service messing it up? Yeah. So uh, our, our uh, defense against that, um, first of all, we, you know, we have good customer service people. And uh, second of all, uh, we, that invoke with valid args lets us really be strict about the kind of, of arguments that we'll accept. And in certain very dangerous things, uh, uh, they actually will ask for this. It's uh, funny enough. They'll ask for uh, belts and suspenders, basically. Like, we're, um, there was one case where, where they had to, like, uh, not, not delete an account, but, like, delete, you know, some set of emails or something. And, like, you know, if we invoke this command, you, we have to give you the account defined two different ways. And if we don't do that, reject it for us. I'm like, okay, yeah, and we built that in. So, is there any model behind it? Or? Well, the, the Linux nodes themselves you know, are, are protected access to theirs. So not everybody has access to the, to the nodes. Not everybody has access to the command line. Not everybody has access to the save control invocation, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yep, uh, right here on the third row. Instead of core what? Quartz or quartzite. Quartz or quartzite. So the question was, why are we using cron plus our own little uh, you know, job scheduling instead of quartz or quartzite? Um, the second half of that question is hard for me to answer because I don't know what quartz or quartzite is. Um, I do know that uh, a lot of this, uh, yeah, uh, depending on when, when uh, quartz or quartzite came out, th this probably was written before that. Uh, a lot of this code was actually written in 2009 and 2010, or these systems were uh, built up then. So a lot of things that we may take for granted now in the closure ecosystem simply didn't exist. Uh, and so it was sort of invented here. As far as why cron particularly is used plus around job scheduling, I, I don't know the historical background of that question, so I, I can't answer that part. I guess that was a very unsatisfactory answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I got a question here in the shadows. I can't see your face, but I see your hand. You're sort of two thirds of the way up. Yes, you. Um, so can you talk about how you test uh, in this environment? So, like unit testing and uh, like integration testing? Sure. So the question was uh, can I talk about how we uh, test uh, in this environment, unit testing, integration testing? Um, well, it, it turns out that unit testing is actually pretty easy um, because all the, all the modules are doing in particular is. Uh, loading up namespaces. So if I require the same namespace, I can test all the functions in there, no problem. Um, when it comes to things like configuration, we have a way to override config. So say uh, I want to test out if I have a bad configuration for uh, connecting to RabbitMQ, you know, what are my functions going to do? Uh, in that test itself, I can, uh, I can do a with redefs and invoke the override config command and override that particular configuration and then run the functions that I want inside of that sort of, uh, you know, badly written, now overridden uh, config environment. Let's see, next question. Maybe, I'm looking, I see a hand back on the far left side. Yes, you. Yeah, I got a question. So, um, what was the motivation for developing a command line tool with a separate interface? Uh, usually you have existing REST interfaces with your own validation and caching them. I'm curious what you think about that. Okay, so I, I caught most of that. Um, I think that the question was, uh, what was the motivation behind writing a command line system for sending these commands instead of, say, using, you know, writing a web service or, or REST interface? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's another historical question, which unfortunately I can't answer completely, but I can say that one of the things that um, the command line interface gives us that a REST service can't is that it's scriptable for people in ops. Uh, so I know of instances where uh, there's certain series of commands that uh, they uh, run often or they 
maybe they uh, get some log data and then they run safe controls based on that log data and then they look for more stuff in the logs and they pull other things out. Um, and that's uh, something they're able to do because we've written this command line interface. Uh, another thing is, is that you know, us, us safers, we're, we're back-end guys. Uh, back-end is what we know. So it's certainly a lot easier for us uh, in terms of uh, speed and, and ease of testing and turnaround to you know, develop a new command line interface than it would be for us to add a new uh, REST endpoint with you know, a new set of arguments and then talk to you know, whoever's right in the front end to have that also updated. Uh, we can just update safe, send it out, done. You know, it's, it's much faster that way. Other? I, I'm, I'm seeing another pointing. Ah, yes, thank you. <laughs> you in the middle there. You're a very good pointer. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Can you comment on the immutability of config? So when you call config in different spots in the code, or are you doing it at the top level? How uh, fast does it refresh or change? OK, so the question is going to talk about the immutability of config, like how fast does it refresh or change? So our config is read in once on startup, and that's it. So if you want to change a config value, you have to shut down the service and restart. I'm seeing, I'm seeing more pointing. Ah, OK. Sorry, the light's like right there, man. Yeah, you. How do you handle different configurations between your builds? How do we handle different configurations between our builds? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying to parse that. Uh, OK. so. What I, what I think you're getting at is we, we have the config is uh, written out to each uh, safe node in the different environments by chef. So chef controls uh, or chef knows, you know, this safe is going to be starting up in QA. It's going to need this set of config. Uh, this safe is going to be starting up in production. It's going to need this set of config. Does that answer your question there? So the question was, do we have different config um, files for dev versus QA? We don't have a, a variable that we uh, look for on load. Uh, and the answer is no, because it's both. Uh, so we have uh, some of the config, uh, like for uh, the different flavors of safe, safe uh, that's going to be processing PSTs, which is going to run on a Windows node, uh, like what modules it has. That's all written in the, the basic config file that goes everywhere. Um, and that is switched off based on environment variables. And then also, Chef overrides some config based on the environment uh, when it makes sense. Uh, you know, things for Chef to know about that, that we as developers don't care, like, uh, you know, where the uh, Elasticsearch instance is that we're going to be talking to. We don't care. Just tell us where it is, we'll go. I'm trying to screen off the light there so I can see any final questions. All right, I don't see any. I'm looking at pointing guy. He's not pointing. So I think we're done. All right, thanks again.